um, I've actually been appointed very recently as the associate. Hello, um, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on um, a, the results of a research on the use of Agile in large projects and large organizations. Uh, my name is Yvon Petit. I'm a professor in uh, project management at the Business School of the University of Quebec in Montreal. Uh, and um, I've actually been appointed very recently as the Associate uh, Dean for International Relations. Uh, but my previous background before becoming a, a professor um, uh, was uh, to work for uh, large organizations as a project manager. Uh, I've worked for Reuters and I worked for uh, Ericsson. And um, I've got an engineering background, but uh, I've, I've worked as a project manager for the last 20 years. And uh, when I became a um, professor, uh, my research interests um, uh, have been, since I've uh, here as a professor, uh, research interests have been on uh, project portfolio management and um, the use of Agile in, in large organizations. Uh, and um, working on portfolio management, especially in very dynamic uh, environments, um, led me to uh, be an interested in the, um, you know, sort of the use of Agile by these large organizations. Uh, I was involved in the, um, the core team for the portfolio management standards uh, for PMI, and I've been a member of the Standards Mag uh, member advisory group uh, for PMI for the last five years. So, what I'm going to present uh, today. Uh, is really um, uh, the uh, how are large organizations really uh, sort of scaling up uh, agile and um, this uh, research project was initiated in 2012 uh, with another professor his name was uh, Claude Besnais uh, unfortunately passed away uh, uh, last year and I, I continued the research with another uh, professor here um, called uh, Brian Hobbs. Um, you might have be familiar with that name. He's uh, been publishing a lot. He's a PMI fellow. He's been publishing a lot on uh, uh, project management offices. Um, but we did. Uh, we started this research in 2012 uh, initially with. Uh, informal discussions with people from the industry and uh, also with the uh, members of the uh, Agile community in, in Montreal. And uh, what triggered really the, the research was, the, first of all, the observation that there had been very little um, uh, academic uh, research or academic, there was fairly little in the, in the academic literature on Agile, uh, especially when it, um, it uh, it was related to you know the use of agile in large organizations, which is what we were noticing. Uh, many uh, large organizations were starting to use uh, agile, but most of the literature was on the use of agile for let's say a single team or much much smaller projects. So we saw a research opportunity there, and uh, we started to uh, to um, investigate this. Now, if we go back to the uh, agile principles. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, very good statements there, and, uh, and uh, I would say that most of the software development um, organizations or uh, anybody involved in IT, I mean, uh, has been looking at this agile practices and that Scrum more, uh, more um, uh, specifically. Um, but when you look at these principles, some of them, um, you wonder how you would scale them to a much larger organization. Uh, for example, uh, business people and developers must work together daily. Okay, that's fine if you have a small team of uh, seven people, one of them being the product owner, and they're just sitting there with the team. That works fine. That works miracle, and it does the job. Uh, what happens if you start having five, ten teams, and you have an organization of thousands of people across multiple countries and time zones? Uh, this becomes very difficult, and uh, we were just curious how these large organizations were actually doing this. Um, 
the other thing was favor the use of face-to-face -face conversations. We all know this is much more efficient than emails or documents or specifications. And once again, we, we wonder how they were doing this in large organizations. The, the other two uh, principles uh, that uh, sort of uh, we found challenging for these large organizations was uh, simplicity is essential. I mean, many of these organizations are developing very complex systems with multiple subsystems and interfaces with legacy systems. Um, and uh, they, they're anything but, but simple. And um, uh, again, we wondered uh, how they were doing this. And finally, this uh, 11 principle architecture emerges from self-organizing teams. Um, we could follow the self-organizing teams because um, uh, you'll see in the results, uh, many of the organizations, that's one of the principles that they try to implement by creating uh, development teams that would um, be more autonomous, uh, be self-organized. But the portion of the uh, architecture, we, uh, we were thinking that th this can be uh, when you have a, a large organization. We were wondering how organizations would, uh, would actually do this. So starting with this sort of idea that these four principles, how do uh, large organizations do it in um, large projects, we initiated a, um, uh, a uh, research. Actually, uh, I forgot to mention, of course, uh, in, in small projects, um, I would say the methodology that is most often used is Scrum, uh, where you have a product backlog and you create a, a sprint backlog for the upcoming two to four weeks. You have daily scrums, uh, typically stand-up meetings, and then you have uh, shippable, testable, uh, tested products that you could potentially ship to the to the customer. And uh, you continue like this until you're uh, ready to ship and uh, release to the customer. Now, uh, most of the organizations that we've met in our research um, sort of started from that approach, and um, they were familiar with this approach, and I assume that uh, uh, most people um, uh, participating in this webinar would be familiar with this uh, Scrum. Now, this is a, a, very, a very good um, uh, technique and approach for a single team, single approach, and um, actually um, there was a publication by Krushten in 2013 uh, who talked about um, uh, Agile sweet spot, and an Agile sweet spot would be the type of development and the type of organizations where Agile would be ideal, and uh, that would be, for example, if um, what he, he refers to as system size are about 12, you know, where if you start having a very large system of, you know, 300 components and hundreds of components might become more difficult. Greenfield, high rate of change in-house with a stable architecture and co-located team, simple rule of governance, you have a perfect sweet spot for Agile. But uh, in our case, we were actually interested in what happens uh, if you implement Agile outside of these uh, sweet spots. So as researchers, we have, of course have research questions, and in our case, uh, the, research, uh, the first research question was how does the context of large complex organizations affect the adaptation and adoption of Agile approaches? So first question. And next one was what are the challenges faced during their implementation in that context? And of course, what are they actually doing uh, to um, to alleviate these these uh, challenges, so we started um, by uh, defining what we meant by large organizations and large projects. Um, in our case, um, we aimed for organizations uh, with more than two thousand uh, employees. Um, and the reason we looked not only at the project but at the organizations is that large organizations. And, and by the way, the Organizations we looked at were much bigger than 2,000 employees, but we, this was a, a sort of a, a low uh, threshold. Is that this um, introduces a level of complexity from the organization point of view, and uh, uh, it was important for us to to have that criteria. The other one is uh, we looked at uh, projects with development teams of. Uh, 
um, more than three development teams because once again it introduces um, uh, a level of complexity and coordination between teams that uh, you wouldn't uh, require with a single team. Now, uh, we started with a qualitative um, uh, study. Uh, qualitative study being we go in the uh, organizations and um, uh, we interview people at different levels of the organization. So we interviewed uh, scrum masters and product owners and uh, the executives. And if there was a project manager, the project manager, the project office, uh, actually different levels of the organization. And uh, we met three types of organizations. And I'll describe the, the first three cases that we um, met. Uh, and in each case, we tried to investigate three projects. So we had, uh, in the initial case, nine case studies in, in the three types of organizations. And then, um, based on those uh, more in-depth analysis, we met three more uh, organizations where we, we just met, uh, we analyzed one case. It was really to validate some of the findings. Now, following this, we um, did a survey Uh, and um, we had uh, quite a few questions, and the questions were actually uh, coming from our observations from the qualitative study. Um, of course, um, for such a survey, uh, you would have we would have liked to have like hundreds of responses, but because we were targeting for very large projects and very large organizations, we ho we only had 48 uh, responses. They were from different parts of the world, and they were uh, both in French and uh, English. But the good news is that uh, the results that I'll present, what uh, we saw in the survey and what we saw in the qualitative uh, study was very similar in terms of the, the, the findings. Um, so uh, um, we have published the results of the um, uh, of the uh, the research last year, so what I'm presenting now has al already been published in a uh, academic journal and in a book, and I'll mention the um, the reference at the end of the the presentation. Okay, so if we, I go back to my three types of organizations, my initial three cases, um, the first one was what we called large systems, and I cannot name the. Uh, organizations is for uh, ethics uh, reason. And um, so the first organization was a large, um, uh, they were developing large complex systems meant to be sold to uh, external customers and they were um, uh, sold uh, around the world. So it's a uh, multinational. Uh, the projects that we looked at had between five and ten teams per project, so they were fairly uh, fairly big. And uh, in their case, the reason to um, implement Agile um, was uh, to reduce the time to market. They had a very unstable scope, so um, they were trying to uh, stabilize the scope using uh, Agile. And um, they were developing a lot of Uh, functionality, so they needed a way to chunk through uh, all this functionality in their their large systems. And the way they, they uh, deployed uh, John, they started with a pilot with small projects. They saw the benefits of this, and then they deployed. Um, uh, they deployed Agile in, in larger projects in other departments. It was sort of a cross-fertilization across uh, other departments. So that was the uh, first case. Second case, uh, it was in a financial service uh, organization, again, a multinational, a large organization, but in this case, rather than developing systems to be sold to customers, they were developing internal systems for uh, different parts of their, uh, their organization. 
questions. In this case, the projects were a bit uh, smaller. Um, we even had one of the projects with only one uh, one team, so it defeated the purpose a little bit, but uh, the, the two others were uh, three uh, at least three teams. Uh, in this case, why uh, Agile was uh, sort of a local initiative of uh, a few champions, and um, they wanted to increase the, the speed and had uh, and have uh, deliverables closer to the um, customer uh, expectations, even though the customers were internal. In their particular case, uh, it was also strongly related to the CIO's, CIO's viewpoint. So um, we saw, for example, the they, they changed CIO in mid-course, and that changed the deployment of, uh, uh, of Agile in that particular organization. Now, the third one is a large uh, public sector um, uh, organization developing very large uh, systems with a lot of legacy. When I mean lots of legacy, these systems have been around for, in some cases, decades, uh, certainly years, uh, and they, have, uh, uh, they uh, either have to be uh, replaced or upgraded or new functionality needs to be uh, added to these systems. And uh, they had between two and seven teams per, per project. And in this particular case was um, uh, with uh, traditional approaches, the, the projects were taking extremely long time and the quality was, uh, was very poor and, and did not fit uh, the customer expectations. So uh, in this case, they had to do something um, to, to uh, improve the fit to the customer needs. Uh, in this particular case, in the previous slide, I forgot to mention, uh, they did start with a number of pilots and try to, to get uh, close, uh, bigger. In the case of the public sector, it was a bit unusual that they started with their largest project first, and they wanted to to make the demonstration that if they could do it with this largest project, then um, they could then uh, cascade to all the other uh, smaller projects without without a problem. So they um, hired people external to the uh, organizations, uh, and they were very strong people. They um, implemented that in very large projects uh, with the ambition to demonstrate that it was feasible even in the largest uh, project. Okay, so those were my three initial cases. We had three projects in each um, uh, case. And what we did afterwards, we sent uh, questionnaires uh, for a survey. We analyzed this, and we group all the observations in, in five um, broad categories, and then I'll go uh, through the five um, uh, groups of observations. So the first one was, uh, how, these, how do organizations actually deploy? Why do they deploy these agile practices? Um, we were also uh, wanted to know, um, uh, how do they use Sprint Zero? Because that was something that was uh, common, that was used in, in most of the projects we had seen, but there was some... Uh, diversity and, and uh, approaches, so we were curious about that. Um, impacts on the organizations, impacts on uh, the roles, so uh, when we introduce Agile, uh, what are the impacts on the different roles in the organizations, and finally the last group was the different tools, techniques, and uh, whether they were using uh, a scaling framework. So let's start with uh, uh, the deployment of uh, Agile approaches. Uh, so, um, one of the benefits when we ask the questions, uh, what's the benefit of Agile approaches, uh, most of the answers were related to a, a better focus on the customer needs and on the cre uh, value creation. Uh, so, this is really a summary, and I, what I'll show here is some of the statements and some of the percentages, uh, you know, percentage of people that answered. Of course, it's a small um, sample, uh, but it, it gives a pretty good um, indication uh, of, um, uh, of the, for example, in this particular case, of the benefits, which, which are the benefits that are most often encountered. And, and like I said, uh, this matches some of the observations that we made in the in the qualitative study. Um, so, uh, in 71% of the cases, 
better adapted to customer needs, and that's the main benefit uh, seen by the Agile, um, better prioritization, more centered on creation of business value. Uh, and it's really much, much lower down. Uh, well, we, we have rapid delivery to, to customers, but, uh, um, uh, you know, we don't see uh, other arguments such as, uh, I don't know, improve quality or improve efficiency or reduce costs or things like this. Really, the main benefits when we ask people is really that what gets developed and what gets delivered to the uh, uh, to the, uh, the the customers is much closer to um, uh, to what they expect. And uh, in one of the cases, they even said that uh, uh, they went from uh, traditional uh, projects when they were de delivering it was sort of a complete disaster. Uh, people, you know, created a lot of uh, animosity. And uh, now with um, uh, with the, the delivery of agile, it becomes a sort of a, a happy event. You know that uh, the, the the uh, customers expect or that the uh, internal customers expect. So, um, uh, so the conclusion here, focus on customer needs and um, uh, on value creation. Probably nothing new if you're familiar with Too Agile, but this was also applicable to large, large organizations. Um, uh, the the other uh, thing that we ask is, uh, well, uh, we hear about all these benefits, but um, uh, uh, what about disadvantages? Do you see any any challenges or any disadvantages of using uh, agile approaches? And uh, the one that came top here was the difficulty in committing to project parameters. Um, and um, if I can expand a little bit on this, is uh, if you have have an organization, and I, I will pick on this financial institution because that's probably typical of a large organization, uh, they, they were used to having uh, traditional projects with a gating system uh, where the people deciding on the investment on the projects would know exactly what would be the outcome, the expected outcome in terms of scope, in terms of time, and in terms of, um, uh, you know, of, of quality and, uh, and cost. So if they invest, they would want to know exactly what they're going to get and uh, when they were going to, to get it. Now, with Agile, it's, it's more difficult. I mean, there's a, there's a commitment on the cost. I mean, you have sort of a fixed capacity delivering stuff. Uh, you have, um, uh, you know, you can predict the timing. You can say you're going to have deliveries, I don't know, every month or every releases every three months, for example, uh, based on internal iterations. But it's much harder to say, here's exactly what you're going to have in the, the coming year, you know, because uh, you're defining your... Uh, your sprints as you go. So uh, this was seen as one of the main, well, could say disadvantages, but at least one of the things that sort of came out. Uh, the other one is uh, creation of technical depth. Um, for those not familiar with the term, uh, this means when uh, you're implementing, developing something, and um, you decide uh, to just do a portion of whatever you have to do just to fulfill the initial requirement and you say you know that there's something else that might have to be done to, to be completed later on so you sort of push some of the stuff uh, to be done later and and in some some cases you never get back to it uh, so you sort of create the, the term is to is called technical depth is sort of creation of whatever you have to do in the future that should have done uh, earlier. Um, now, refactoring as well, even during the development uh, that was seen uh, in the cases as well, um, you know, that you, you would do something for the initial sprint uh, that you would have to redo uh, uh, later on. Um, so, uh, and uh, we also saw some impact on quality and the documentation uh, in some of the um, uh, the case studies, and that was also seen in the uh, the survey. Now, uh, conditions facilitating agile implementation and deployment. Um, we of course saw in the cases and the survey the traditional management support. I mean, the, any of these deployments cannot be done without the management support. So I'm just re repeating. I think what's quite obvious. Uh, you need the support from the organizations and from every part of the organization, and you need sometimes to change the culture to um, uh, 
uh, get away from the sort of management control to sort of deploying the autonomy of the teams and, and giving away some of the control to, to the teams. Now, I skipped the first bullet here uh, because in all the cases that we met, um, the the justification and the um, facilitating condition to implement Agile was the previous performance of the traditional project. So they said, well, previous projects uh, were, were late, cost too much, uh, the, the scope was wrong, so we have to do something and, and, uh, and uh, deploy this. And it became sort of a facilitating condition to, to deploy Agile in these, uh, these large organizations. Uh, the deployment strategy in most um, cases, first of all, they were fairly recent uh, deployments. Um, uh, in all cases that we met, and also in the in the survey, uh, everything was less than a few years uh, in terms of the very large projects, large organizations. So I would say it's a fairly new phenomenon, uh, certainly uh, in the last less than 10 years or less than five years even. Uh, and in most cases, they started with a pilot. Um, so they didn't try to deploy um, Agile at large, you know, in hundreds of people and tens of teams. They started with small teams, with, the, uh, with small projects, with the ex ex exception of that public sector, uh, which started with the, the largest uh, project. So it seems to that the um, the trend is to start with uh, start small and then um, develop the competence. Um, uh, in the cases, uh, many of the cases, they involve uh, external consultants to to help out. Um, and uh, Scrum was the dominant uh, methodology across. And uh, in most cases that we um, uh, that we interviewed, that we met, um, they had started with Scrum with a small um, pilot, and then they had sort of adapted themselves, didn't try to implement a, a scaling framework, a sort of commercial scaling framework. I'll get back to that later in the in the presentation because uh, as I speak, uh, there are um, now commercial scaling frameworks uh, so like uh, SAFE and uh, Nexus and um, uh, LESS. Uh, but at the time of the interviews, these frameworks were not uh, well known or deployed. So most of these organizations were actually t uh, trying to deploy their own uh, development of, of uh, sort of a scaling uh, scrum. And um, most of them use external uh, coaches to help out. Um, 33% of the survey response, not that high, uh, but certainly in the, the cases that we um, in, uh, looked at, they were using external uh, support. Uh, in all these organizations and also in the uh, the survey, um, we asked them, okay, now you're using Agile. Are you using Agile in all your projects? And uh, in the, certainly in the, the 12 cases or in the, the six organizations that we had met, um, uh, they were not using Agile in all the, the, or the their projects. Um, uh, and in the survey, it was about 73% that used both Agile and traditional. So that means somebody somewhere has to take a decision to use Agile or not. Uh, uh, but what was a bit surprising is that in 77% of the cases, there were no clear rules or guidelines that had been developed to help on the uh, selection process. So, uh, yes, they were doing some traditional projects and some Agile development, um, but uh, it was somewhat uh, ad hoc uh, decision, uh, not following specific rules, for example, of a specific type of systems or a specific size of, of, uh, of system. Uh, okay, so second um, uh, group of observation was on the sprint uh, zero. Uh, we had heard the expression and we had seen it in, in many of the uh, projects. Um, and um, uh, we asked uh, the respondent whether they were using the expression, and in 73% of the cases they were. Uh, we then asked them uh, what activities are covered in a sprint zero, and um, we had things like planning of sprints, uh, the production of the high-level architecture, the writing of the stories of the first sprints, the creation of epics, and the creation of the product backlog. So. 
basically in the print zero is the preparations for the development, the planning of the sprints, and high level of the architecture. And I'll get back to the to this. So, and uh, in like three quarter of the cases, they do use that expression. And they use uh, sprint zero. Uh, on the emerging uh, architecture, uh, which is, like I said, one of the principal, um, uh, we saw that in 94%, and actually all the cases that we saw in 94% uh, of the responses uh, responded indicated that there was some form of upfront uh, time allocated to develop an architecture. So it's not like, uh, let's start developing um, our large systems without even thinking about some form of, of architecture. Uh, but they did spend less time compared to the traditional approaches. And for the majority of the respondent, it was uh, between 30% and 67% of the initial time. So it's bit, uh, about two-thirds of the time, or between one-third and two-thirds of the time. So that means rather than spending, let's say, six to nine months thinking of the architecture and doing all the function, the, um, the specifications, they would have a high-level architecture maybe in a month or two months or three months and then start developing that, knowing that they, they might have to uh, update and rework the architecture later on. So um, that was the main observations on the Sprint Zero and emerging um, architecture. Now on the uh, organization, um, we saw first of all in terms of the teams um, that uh, most of the teams uh, that we had seen and also when we asked had Scrum masters, product owners, and developers. And developers might uh, have different names. Uh, they, you know, they could be programmers or whatever, but uh, um, we saw this as a recurring pattern that at least these three um, uh, were seen in the teams. Um, in the t cases that we um, uh, had studies, most of the teams were sort of a seven plus or minus two, which is something, uh, something we see in the literature as, some, as a sort of reasonable size for a uh, development teams. Uh, this is where level of interaction is, is sort of manageable um, and the level of communication you know, is not um, uh, too complicated. Uh, however, in the survey, uh, the average number of uh, team members was 12.8, so around 13 members. And we even had 15% of the teams with more than 18 uh, members, which was a bit of a, of a surprise. We were expecting the teams uh, to be uh, to be uh, smaller, so that might be a, a a topic for further research. It was at least a surprise to uh, to us in terms of the size of the teams. Uh, we also observed that there were a lot of um, what we call specialist teams, things like uh, uh, scrums of scrums and architecture teams, integration teams, and steering committees and client decisional committees. But uh, if I take the example of the architecture team, if you have five to ten teams in, in, in your development and they want to coordinate, uh, you know, if there's a new interface or if there's an impact on other parts of the system, uh, they need somewhere to, to exchange, you know, across the, the teams. And they, they, they often had some sort of uh, technical teams like an architecture team or an integration teams where they could bring up some of these, uh, these issues. Um, now, uh, I mentioned before that in terms of the specialists being part of the teams, um, here we had a fairly long list, so it's, it's a bit harder to, to uh, have any conclusion uh, here because some use, for example, integration tester or um, uh, system integrator, business analyst in the, in the team. So I found this result a bit harder to, um, to analyze. Uh, so as far as the teams are concerned, some of the challenges that are faced are, uh, are not necessarily specific to, to the multiple teams. Uh, there are sort of traditional uh, team management that you would see in a single team. The, 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 the only uh, things that we've observed as, as solutions for this is that um, uh, teams are very often co-located in uh, an open space. Um, 
uh, with some uh, increased autonomy, uh, the large organizations would tend to uh, keep the team as is, as a permanent teams. Um, some organizations call them semi-permanent. So you, you try to keep it permanent, but you know there will be some movements for you know, sickness or leave of absence or, or whatever, uh, turnover. Uh, but they would try to keep the teams permanent and not changing them um, uh, once a delivery is, uh, is com completed. And they, they would also aim for uh, more polyvalence, so having less specialized uh, members. So that we've observed in the, um, in, the, uh, in the cases that we have visited. Now, what we call here a residual challenge is that um, multi-site team seems uh, to be a challenge and not uh, something that works uh, very well. At least uh, that's what we've observed in the, uh, in the cases uh, that we saw. Uh, most of them had teams in multiple locations, and that was not such a big issue to coordinate between teams across multiple sites. But when you try to have members of a single team spread out, let's say, across multiple locations with uh, different time zones and things like that. Um, at least the feedback that we received uh, during the interviews that, that if you can try to avoid this, try to avoid this. It's okay to have multiple teams in, in multiple locations, but to have uh, members spread out in multiple sites uh, does not work very well. Okay. Uh, What's the impact of the agile approaches on the roles? Um, the role that actually uh, received the most major impact is the project manager. Uh, when we ask the question, uh, which of these roles ha have been the most impacted by the agile, project manager came first. And um, we heard a lot of comments during the interviews that um, Project managers will be will be disappearing. Um, that uh, there's no need for project managers in the uh, agile um, projects. But at least in the cases, that's not what we observed. There were still project managers there. But we did ask the question um, uh, in the survey. Uh, for example, how many project manager do you have? And in 11% of the cases, there were no project managers. So there were. Uh, sort of a continuous development shops. And uh, I would say that uh, since our research, um, uh, there's more and more in the trend, at least in the different frameworks, to uh, go towards something which is more continuous, like the DevOps, for example, having like a pipeline where you, you would deliver continuously and you would not have a notion of beginning of an end. But in, in this particular case, um, uh, uh, it, it was fairly small, the number of um, respondents that said that did not have any uh, project manager. Uh, what's the impact on the role of the project manager? Well, uh, they do more stakeholder management than they used to, and they do less detailed planning uh, and less coordination they, they, uh, of the teams themselves. They leave that to the, to the team to, to coordinate. Uh, there are new roles introduced with uh, with Agile, like uh, Scrum Masters and Product Owners. And um, in our observations, Scrum Masters seems to be spread out. Um, didn't seem to be such of an issue. Uh, they they receive a lot of training, and they they they're up to the challenge. For what we we saw, um, we saw more challenges with the product owners, um, and very often the product owner would be taken out of a, of a line organization somewhere. Uh, they had uh, difficulty understanding their role. They didn't necessarily have the authority to take the decision, so they would have to turn back and uh, ask um, for some, uh, somebody else's uh, advice or to, uh, somebody else to take the decision. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, their uh, presence or their availability daily was also quite, uh, quite difficult. So I would say more challenging on the... Uh, product owners. Uh, what were the tools, techniques, and um, uh, some uh, words on the scaling framework? So, uh, on the tools, we asked, um, and here we were at the sort of lower level techniques. What uh, tools and techniques are, are you using? What came out uh, top was the use of daily stand-up meetings and the use of uh, back. Further down, but uh, by far the most uh, 
the most used techniques are the product backlog and uh, the daily uh, stand-up meetings. Um, and as far as the frameworks are, are concerned, um, uh, like I said, in, in the cases that we studied, um, five of them did not uh, refer to a, a framework. Um, and um, in, in one cases, uh, whatever they had in, implemented was very close to safe, but they did not refer to it as safe. Um, uh, but they had multiple levels, something that that looked like uh, like safe. Uh, in in the respondent of the surveys, uh, only 90% said that they had um, uh, that they they were using. Using a, a framework, and when we ask, okay, if you're using a framework, which one is it? Most of them uh, mention safe, and and this is, um, I would say, consistent also with uh, surveys that uh, version one does in the in the U.S. Uh, on a yearly basis. That uh, I think that uh, in these large organizations that seem, seem to have a, a large um, a large market share. So um, just to conclude, concluding remark here, um, first of all, the um, results in the case studies and the survey were, were pretty co coherent. We found very similar things. Uh, what came out was that um, uh, the deployment in most cases would start with small pilots and then uh, would be scaled up. Um, and in some organizations, it might even mean um, uh, to have multiple instances of small projects. So in some organizations, it might mean that scaling up Agile means having many projects using, many small projects using Agile, but this is not what we were talking about here. Um, they would, um, uh, people claim that uh, they receive significant benefits and the main benefits would be better fit of the um, uh, products to what the customer expects. Um, if I go back to one of the cases that we studied, um, they said that in the traditional projects, they were developing a lot of functionality that um, were never used, you know, a little bit like uh, uh, if you look at Microsoft Project and you look at how much of the functionality that you really use, you know, it's very small. Uh, it was the same thing that they, they said that a lot of the functionality that they were developing were never used by the, the, the customers. So uh, they, they found that using Agile had a better fit to the expectation. Now, uh, we're talking here of a two to three years uh, jo uh, journey. So if you're starting from scratch with traditional projects, you say, oh, Agile sounds like a good idea. We should deploy it in our uh, organization. Uh, you're up for uh, a few years effort. Um, and we've, we have not seen or not uh, um, receive in the survey uh, anything less than that. You know, it, it's it's a long uh, process. Uh, it has major impacts on uh, specific roles, specifically on the project manager, uh, but also on the product owners and the scrum masters, and uh, those roles need to be uh, defined. Now, the, the question on the role of the project manager is definitely changing. Um, and uh, we might wonder if it will even disappear. Uh, we see this, for example, in some of the frameworks. Um, for me, that will be maybe my next uh, sort of investigation as a, uh, sort of uh, where is the project manager really fitting in these uh, agile projects. And um, very little research on scaling frameworks. Uh, I'm just doing now, uh, uh, I just did um, completed one other research with a uh, colleague on the one organization that had deployed uh, uh, SAFE. Um, so we will We'll be publishing results on this, but there's very, very little research on this. If you're aware of any of it, I would be interested to, to hear about this. Um, so if this presentation was of interest to you and you want to find out more uh, or read more, uh, there were two things published last year. Um, uh, June last year. Uh, first of all, there was a monography. Uh, it was published by PMI. The first author is Brian Hobbs. I'm the second author. It's called Agile Approaches on Large Projects and Large Organizations. If you're a PMI member, you can download this for free from the PMI site, um, or you can buy a hard copy. Uh, 
And uh, we also published in the Project Management Journal um, a, an article which is really a summary of the book, uh, but also a summary of what uh, I just presented um, uh, now. So um, I hope uh, that you enjoyed the presentation, the webinar, and um, I'll be answering questions um, uh, right after this. So thank you for listening to this. To this. Thank you so much for that presentation. We're going to move right into our Q&A. And uh, we had a lot of questions come through. We discussed uh, several of those as they were coming in. Um, and so really quickly, uh, Ivan, how do you scale for a large organization maybe that's either global or decentralized or you have a lot of folks that uh, are working remotely? Right. So, um, I mean, that's a good question. And it's actually a challenge that, most of these large organizations would face. Uh, it's hard to think of uh, a large organization of uh, a few thousand people, uh, you know, being all in one building or in one, even in one location. Most of these organizations actually have uh, multiple sites, multiple teams in uh, multiple countries. Um, what I mentioned in the presentation is at least in the cases that we observed, um, uh, most of them had teams in more than one location. And in one case, they even had uh, teams spread across uh, continents, like having uh, some members in Europe and some members in, in, um, in, in Canada. Um, however, their, uh, um, uh, their lessons learned or their observation was that in this particular case, was not, it didn't work very well, especially because of the time zone. Uh, the recommendation was to have the, co the teams co-located, uh, but it was okay to have multiple teams in multiple locations, if that makes sense. So at least the observations that we have seen is that having this te the teams spread in multiple locations uh, is detrimental, but having multiple teams in multiple locations was okay, that they, they found the, mecha the mechanisms to coordinate across, uh, across the different teams. And when you were talking about the different methodologies, you, you mentioned that maybe Scrum was, was the largest in, in terms of your case studies, then it was safe. Um, what can you say about, you know, about less or, or, you know, scaled Scrum, safe, any of those other uh, methodologies? Um, when do you use those? Right. Uh, so uh, when we did this study, um, most of these frameworks were, were still under development or had not been um, uh, deployed. Uh, so um, at least in the six cases that we interviewed, um, they used some form of uh, Scrum to start uh, with small projects. Um, and they, uh, they went from there either by developing their own um, approach. And I would say most of them, uh, what we saw, look something like less. You know, you have a number of teams that you try to uh, coordinate. You have a common uh, backlog that you then spread across the teams. Uh, there was one of the organizations that uh, used something that looked like SAFE. Um, they didn't call it like that, but it was very close to that. Um, but really, um, uh, in my conclusion, is, is something that has not been researched very much, um, the use of these different frameworks. So when I saw the questions, you know, which framework should I use for this or that, um, it was not really the purpose of the, uh, of the research on continuing on, on, the, on the, uh, studying, for example, the use of SAFE in, in some large organizations, but there's been very little uh, sort of academic research on that on that topic. Uh, what what we have seen is that safe has been used on very large organizations, which has uh, uh, you know already a sort of a large structure for portfolios and things like this, and less is being used for um, uh, sort of IT projects, which would be I don't know four or five teams, something like this. So, but, but yes, there would be, uh, uh, it would require additional research on that particular question. And so, as companies are going about their agile transformation, what, what would you suggest to be the best project type and size to make 
that you do your first agile project with. Right, yeah. Um, what we saw in most of the cases um, and also in the survey was that most organizations started with um, a small a small project rather than trying to deploy it across the board, um, you know, in all size and all, uh, you know, in all projects and all the, the whole organization. They, they tended to start with a small pilot um, and I would say with a small pilot close to what, uh, what's called the, the sweet spot there, um, in one of the, uh, one of my slides there, you know, something with a high level of uncertainty, um, you know, with, um, you know, scope being, t um, poorly defined or, or very difficult to define. So, uh, you know, if, if you start with a project with all the good characteristics, then you could demonstrate that, uh, you would gain, you would get the benefits of using Agile, you would demonstrate that it works, and you would learn from this, um, because it, it's very difficult to deploy at expertise, um, and, and uh, what we saw is most of the organizations started with some, some small projects to demonstrate. Um, we had one exception in the cases we studied was one of the organizations that actually started with their largest project to make the demonstration that uh, it could work even for this project. Um, but in this particular case, they hired somebody external with a lot of experience in, in Agile and I'm continuing on, on, uh, on uh, studying, for example, the use of SAFE in, in some large organizations, but there's been very little uh, sort of academic research on that, on that topic. Uh, what, what we have seen is that SAFE has been used on very large organizations, which has uh, uh, you know, already a sort of a large structure for portfolios and things like this, and less is being used for um, uh, sort of IT projects, which would be, I don't know, four or five teams, something like that. So, but, but yes, there would be, uh, uh, it would require additional research on that particular question. And so as, as companies are going about their agile transformation, what, what would you suggest to be the best project type and size to maybe do your first agile project with? Right, yeah. Um, what we saw in most of the cases um, and also in the survey was that most organizations started with um, a, small, a small project rather than trying to deploy it across the board, um, you know, in all size and all, uh, you know, in all projects and all the, the whole organization. They, they tended to start with a small pilot. Um, and I would say with a small pilot close to what uh, what's called the, the sweet spot there um, in one of the uh, one of my slides there you know something with a high level of uncertainty um, you know with uh, you know scope being t um, poorly defined or, or very difficult to define so you know if if you start with a project with all the good characteristics then you could demonstrate that. Uh, you would gain, you would get the benefits of using Agile. You would demonstrate that it works, and you would learn from this um, because it, it's very difficult to deploy at large, you know, with hundreds of people uh, across the organization, and uh, just to say, you know, uh, you do you do everything uh, using Agile. You have to sort of build up the expertise. Um, and uh, what we saw is most of the organizations started with some small projects to demonstrate. Um, we had one exception in the cases we studied was one of the organizations that actually started with their largest project to make the demonstration that uh, it could work even for this project. Um, but in this particular case, they hired somebody external with a lot of experience in, in Agile and they did the transformation um, that way. But um, at least for what I saw, um, is that most other organizations started with uh, with this a small organization just to make those demonstrations and to to learn about this. Yeah, we we have.
often joke uh, that uh, depending on who you, you select to be that agile transformation leader, that they're using a waterfall approach to, to implement agile. Uh, and so starting with a small project, small teams, and adapting it as you go, I think is, is the way to be successful. You know, the other thing I see with agile a lot, and, and I'll just, I'll speak, you know, personally on this, you know, I've been a project management manager for 20 years had heard, uh, uh, the rise of Agile, and I disregarded it at first, but I started hearing things like, you know, we don't need project management anymore because we're Agile. We don't need a document anymore because uh, we're Agile. We can't tell you when we're going to be done because we're Agile. And I think that that brings a lot of fear to uh, project managers. And so what roles, you know, and you even said the role of, of project managers kind of going away. So what roles can project managers fill as we move forward in, into that business agility future? Yeah, th this is a question that has uh, has been popping up over and over uh, during during the the research itself, um, and I would say especially I've been attending a lot of um, agile um, I would say uh, conferences or meetings in the agile community, and um, I would say in the agile community if you go to any agile tour, I mean there's one in Montreal which is very big, it's over the, you know 1,500 people every year. And uh, if you go in these meetings, the project manager seems to be the, the sort of the bad guy to, to get rid of, right? Um, but honestly, I think this is more in the, at least for what I've seen so far, and uh, you know, I'm sure things will evolve. Uh, it seems to be more in the discourse than the, in the real things. What we have seen is not the project manager disappearing, but the role of being changed quite a bit. Um, so going away from um, uh, what I, uh, going away from um, being doing the planning and the detail uh, monitoring and controlling, uh, they would delegate this to um, uh, to the teams and um, uh, rather focus on. Um, uh, you know, managing interfaces, managing stakeholders, um, uh, sort of connecting to, let's say, the sponsor or the steering group. You might not want the individual teams to do this sort of thing. Um, you know, making sure that the teams are functioning properly, if there's anything. You know, this sort of role, facilitating the, the, the work, uh, as opposed to doing the planning and doing the monitoring and controlling and all that. Um, but I would say that's my personal observation at this point in time based on what I've seen so far. Uh, and of course, to say something, you know, like the, the role of the project manager might disappear or they're definitely changing uh, in a, a PMI conference where there's more than 10,000 attendances, it may be uh, not entirely politically correct, but I mean, that's the the state of the sort of agile community that, uh, that, that things are changing. Uh, in that direction, the, um, the, the, the role and the expectations from the project manager uh, will be changing. Uh, we have seen in, in very large implementation uh, of Agile framework, which was not the purpose of this study. Uh, like I said, I'm doing another study now on the deployment of SAFE in a very large bank, and uh, they didn't have uh, any project managers. They, they, they went away from even having projects and having more of a continuous deployment. And uh, the project managers that were there, um, I would say became at a sort of higher level, either being sort of release responsible, release trained uh, engineers or at the program level. Um, so somewhat similar roles, somewhat at a higher level, but uh, this is, this has, Definitely a big impact on the role of the project manager, and I'm sure we could make a, a, a not a conference, but certainly a talk just on that topic alone. I completely agree, and and I'm monitoring the the chat window as well, trying to <laughs> just exploding now, so, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get the pulse of of the, uh, the 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 contributors here, and we want to make sure you know just housekeeping wise, we're. We really want to make sure that we have content interaction on the chat window, not so much, you know, advertisement and, and where we're from. Although we love to know where everybody's coming from, um, but somebody actually posted, and I, I tried to catch the comment and went through, but I loved it that he said, 
Scrum is, is framework, Agile is a mindset. And, and so really, any of the methodology you pick is simply a, a framework, but being truly Agile is a mindset for an organization. Mm-hmm. Yes, but, uh, but it's also, uh, I would say yes and no. I mean, if, if you look at the Agile uh, principles and values, those, I would say, are sort of higher level. Uh, you know, those are the things that, you know, you should try to implement, that you should strive uh, towards. Um, uh, but when you look at something like Scrum um, or, or any of the other frameworks, um, they come up with a set of um, of, uh, of tools and, uh, uh, you know, it, it goes beyond uh, some of the principles. So, um, to me, they would be a form of methodology, not just a, a mindset. Um, and uh, we went through this, and I was actually very careful during the presentation and in, even in the book not to use agile methodologies. We, we uh, tend to use the, the term agile approaches um, just to make sure that we just don't focus on the on the methodologies like the tools and things like this, but it's more. Uh, and it was actually one of the questions we asked. I mean, which tools are you using? And there was a long list. You know, uh, uh, are you using um, uh, things like um, uh, uh, stand-up meetings and product backlog and retrospectives? And and all this comes from the tool set of some of these uh, methodologies. For example, the top three on slide 32. Uh, if I could go back to slide 32, um, the top, uh, hoping that that can be seen as I, I'm talking. Uh, if when we ask, you know, are you using these, these tools and and techniques in your project? And that was during the survey. Um, daily stand-up meetings, product backlog, and retrospectives. I mean, those are all tools and techniques that come from uh, from Scrum. Um, Release planning um, goes beyond. I mean, Scrum initially was for like a one team uh, activity. So release planning normally is sort of a higher level when you have to plan, you know, the, rele- the, the development of your, of your teams. Um, but as can be seen, you know, the top three came from Scrum. I'm not sure if I answered the question, but uh, you you yeah. did, but you opened up another one, and, and I'm going to take advantage of it here for a second because as I come from this from a traditional project management, and again I went from traditional project management into agile, and now more of a hybrid approach. When mm-hmm. I see people, you know, put things up here like daily stand-up meetings or retrospectives, you know, we had work breakdown structure meetings, just nobody would would come, and we had lessons learned, but we just weren't employing it properly. So we're changing the terminology, but the activities are a lot of the same, and that's where I see from a project manager's role that they really can develop themselves into a strategic leader through the agile approaches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, agree. I mean, uh, and I would say that's what we've seen. Um, I mean, what we're presenting here is really the results. I mean, uh, when you do a research, it always takes a bit of time. By the time you collect the data, you analyze, and you, uh, uh, you know, this this research really started about uh, four or five years ago. Uh, by the time it, I mean, we published last year. So there's always a bit of a lag uh, between you know the the results and uh, uh, and what we. Um, uh, you know, and what's the, the, the reality. But, um, uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, actually I, I forgot your question now. So, yeah. yeah, but we, we certainly appreciate the research. I think a lot of this research and, and findings is very valuable, especially if you started this four years ago, five years ago, it, it, it'd be awesome to see kind of some of the the results now, right? For sure. I think we're, For sure. we're finally to, to get into a mode where, we're getting really good data around agile transformations because it was in there and, and so many people really approaching it, so many organizations uh, checking it on. So we look forward to more research from you and we certainly appreciate everything you're doing for our profession. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Okay. And maybe on this topic is uh, as a researcher, um, it's always difficult to get access to good grounds uh, for case study, but also when you do surveys, it's good to have uh, people responding. Um, so whenever you get solicited by researchers, don't hesitate to participate because, uh, you know, that will contribute to the advancement of, of knowledge and uh, to this presentations like this. So. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for your time that, that, that you spent with us today. Good. Thank you. So 
gang, we, we've got another chance to visit that exhibit hall. Make sure that you stop by our PMI booths, all of our exhibitor booths. Um, it's so important. We got several questions in the chat window on this one um, about PDUs. Again, we will be automatically reporting uh, PDUs on your behalf. It takes about 14 to 21 business days. Um, I did notice some some good questions around, um, you know, how do we know how those PDUs align to uh, the talent triangle? And we'll try to find that answer for you here really quickly and get that out. Um, otherwise, we're going to take another quick break here, and you do not want to miss this next session. This is uh, one of the most influential people to follow in social media about project management and, and agile.